Good morning everyone, Isambard Kingdom Astronaut here to take on Aeronautics, Aero Files, and the occasional snake oil salesman. I almost grew mutton chops for this. Today we're going to take a look at Jules Verne's classic novel, From the Earth to the Moon. Not only will we look at the accuracy of Verne's work, we'll actually see if a space gun to the moon is possible. So in short, we're going to look at the accuracy, the history of big guns, and then we're going to design our payload ourselves. For those of you who don't know, Jules Verne is one of the fathers of science fiction, whose tales of adventure and wonder have inspired numerous people and projects. One such story is from the Earth to the Moon. The plot is simple. After the American Civil War, the Baltimore Gun Club, headed by M.P. Barbicane, decides to build a giant cannon to shoot a projectile around the moon. Debates are had on whether the gun itself will work, where to build the gun, how much gunpowder to use, and there's even the threat of a duel between Barbicane and one Captain Nickel. Verne's Columbiad gun would be 2.74 meters in diameter and 274 deep filled with 122 metric tons of gun cotton. The projectile would weigh 8.7 metric tons and be made of aluminum. Upon firing, the projectile would get a velocity of 16.4 kilometers a second, losing about five and a half in the atmosphere, leaving about 11 to send the projectile on a free return trajectory around the moon. The book ends with three crew, Barbicane, Captain Nicol, and a French adventurer named Ardan being loaded into the projectile and shot to the moon. But don't worry, there's a sequel called Around the Moon. The book has been noted for predicting future Apollo missions. Both spacecraft are made of aluminum. The Apollo CSM weighed 11.9 metric tons dry, while the projectile weighed 8.73. And both spacecraft had a crew of three. The gun itself was built south of Tampa, Florida, about 135 miles south of the future Cape Canaveral. And of course, you can calculate the rough velocities you need to get from the Earth to the Moon using basic Newtonian mechanics. Which leads us to what Verne got wrong. Verne's most obvious mistake was using a space gun to get to the Moon. If you do the math, the Columbiad projectile would hit 51,000 g's of acceleration, meaning the crew would become soup. And I have some doubts on the structural integrity of the capsule, as it is described in the book, but we'll talk about that. The other big issue is in the gun design itself, but that's more of a no one knew that at the time. Big gun tech later on would discover these things, so I don't blame that entirely on Vern. This is also why I'm not going to talk about the sequel, because that's what 1870s people thought space travel would be like. And it's mostly wrong. The question we're asking here is, could you shoot a projectile to the moon from a space gun? Which leads us into some historical precedents on big guns. The history of big guns is invariably tied to military history. I'm not a military historian. Big guns are based on effectively one principle. Shoot big things from far away at the bad guys, as drawn here. So as you can see here, we have, we have the good guys and we have the bad guys, and they're in a fort. Now, if you were just to run up to them, the bad guys would win. But if you had a big gun, you could shoot heavy things at their fort from, from a safe distance. You could, you know, get a few of the bad guys, you could damage their fortification, and then scare the rest. So big guns and guns in general work like this. You have a tube, it's hollow. Inside it's projectile and 
fuel. You ignite the fuel. It combusts, which generates hot gases. Hot gases make high pressures, which then push the projectile out the tube. And then once it's out of the tube, you know, basic physics takes over. You probably did this all in high school, hopefully. The first big gun we're looking at today is the Paris gun, used in World War I. The Germans, very creatively, used this to shell Paris, which is apparently the smallest thing it could hit. It wasn't that good of a gun, to be honest. Uh, the payload was too small, and the barrel had to be replaced after 60 firings. The gun did gain the world altitude record of 40 kilometers. So high and so far that the gunners had to actually take into account the Earth's rotation when they fired it. Okay, so between wars, Max Valier and Herman Oberth proposed a successor to the Verne Moon gun that would work. It would be mounted inside a mountain, so high up, and use lateral chambers to increase projectile velocity as it went down the tube. So instead of one big boom, it's a big boom and then other booms feeding into it. Now this method would then be incorporated into the next big gun we're going to talk about. V3. Oh boy, the Nazis. Everyone remembers V2, but forgets V3. Probably because, you know, V2 worked. V3 was designed to fire 140 kilogram shells from Calais to London, a distance of 160 kilometers. The gun itself would be built on the side of a hill and be 140 meters long. Uh, it never really fired in this capacity because the Allies bombed it. World War II saw the effective end of big guns. Planes and missiles could do the job better with greater accuracy and better payloads. The onset of the jet and space age brought on plenty of new aerospace development and research. Airplanes can now go faster than the speed of sound, and space was now accessible. But this meant that you needed to do a lot more work in, in fields of study, and one of these areas was the upper atmosphere. So here's the problem. Weather balloons can only reach about 180,000 feet. Now, sounding rockets could reach these parts of the upper atmosphere, but at the time they were expensive and finicky machines. Plus, you wanted to get multiple instances of data at roughly the same amount of time, and a sounding rocket couldn't do it. But you know what could? A gun. After the war, gun-based research was done on a few fronts. The United States Army was interested in gun-launched radio and other field equipment, as well as the upper atmosphere. A lot of this was done at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland, which coincidentally held the altitude record of 70 kilometers. Another was aerophysics research, studying how air moves when it's going really fast. Now, wind tunnels are nice, but expensive, so a team at McGill University devised a cheaper option. Use a gun. The test objects would be fired out of the gun at supersonic velocities, rendering immediate results. This is where we meet the main character of space guns, Gerald Vincent Bull. Bull is an enigma, and there is no way a simple YouTube video could ever really cover him. During his time at CARD at McGill University, Bull came up with a gun-launched satellite system. With Dr. Charles Murray from the Army Ballistics Research Facility and a few others, they came up with HARP, the High Altitude Research Project. The team would take an old 16-inch Navy gun and modify it so that it could shoot payloads into the upper atmosphere and space. Okay, so there are a lot of details in HARP that I'm just going to gloss over. But I will say that HARP found a good launch site on the island nation of Barbados, right around there. Several types of payloads were launched from the HARP gun. Most were named Martlet. Now these range from just simple equipment that had you know, sensors and other instruments to full-blown sounding rockets. And, at least up until the 90s, about half of what we knew about the upper atmosphere was gained through HARP. The gun could be fired multiple times a day at a fifteenth the cost of a sounding rocket. Now, there were other HARP sites, but the big one was in Barbados. But two large guns were also placed at two other facilities. One was at the high water site on the Canada-Vermont border, which coincidentally is the largest gun in the world ever fired. 
and the other is in Yuma. On November 18, 1966, the 16-inch gun in Yuma fired an 84-kilogram Martlet II projectile to 179 kilometers, which is the current altitude record for a projectile launched from a gun. And just for the record, that's higher than what New Shepard can do. Bull still wanted to use HARP to launch satellites into low Earth orbit, but ran into funding issues. The Canadians weren't that interested in the project and had very little funding involved. The US Army had to deal with Vietnam, and then the Air Force took over as the Space Guys. HARP was shut down in 1967. Bull wouldn't be stopped by this. Frustrated? Absolutely. You can read about his personality for yourself. In the wake of HARP, he founded the Space Research Corporation to pursue constructing his super gun that could launch satellites. All he needed was a customer to fund it. And nearly 20 years later, he did. That customer's name? Saddam Hussein. Wait, what? Remember when I said Bull was an enigma? Yeah. Despite its names, the Space Research Corporation did not do much space research. Instead, they did ballistics, improving the accuracy and range of guns for a variety of people, like South Africa, China, and Iraq. Either way, the Iraqi government was interested in Bull's superguns, contracting him to build at least three in March of 1988. The first would be Baby Babylon, 45 meters long and with a .35 meter bore. The next two would be Babylon guns, a 1 meter bore and 156 meters long. These would weigh 1,500 metric tons and can shoot a 600 kilogram projectile 1,000 kilometers. Or, with rockets, put payloads into low Earth orbit. Using an all-solid system like Martlet, the Babylon gun could put, theoretically, 200 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Or, using liquid upper stages, instead of solids, 600 kilograms. All for the low price of 600 bucks a kilogram. Babylon was built in sections that looked like pipeline parts. The obvious reason, of course, is from an engineering standpoint, you just couldn't build a barrel that long. And the second was because Bull had to sneak Babylon gun parts into Iraq due to an arms embargo. It didn't work. The guys making the pipeline sections went, hey, the tolerance here can only mean one thing. A gun. Quick note on that. Babylon would have been a terrible weapon. A simple reconnaissance flight over it could tell you exactly where it was aimed. And even if you hit it with a big tarp or in the side of a mountain, you'd still find it. Here's the thing. Babylon's recoil force would be the equivalent of a small nuclear weapon, which means it would register as an earthquake every time it fired. Though there have been some declassified documents that suggest Iraq was interested in using the Babylon gun as either an ASAT or to launch small satellites that could blind our reconnaissance satellites. The gun barrel segments were seized and the project stopped. Bull was assassinated on March 22, 1990, outside his apartment in Brussels. No one really knows who did this, but the accepted culprit is Mossad. Now, this does not mean the death of space guns, however. At roughly the same time, a team at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory would come up with another design, dubbed the Jules Verne Launcher. The main difference between this gun and previous designs is that it would use hydrogen instead of nitrocellulose as the propellant. The reason for this change is actually quite simple. Much like rockets, Gun dynamics are influenced by icky, icky, horrible fluid mechanics. But, at the end of the day, the exit velocity of the projectile, or the gases leaving the gun, is still influenced by the molecular weight of the propellants. Now, gunpowder uh, combustion products are rather heavy. So the theoretical maximum velocity of a projectile coming out of one is three to three and a half kilometers a second. With hydrogen, which as we all know is much, much lighter, the muzzle velocity caps out between seven and 11 kilometers a second. 
For reference, Earth's escape's velocity is 11.2 kilometers a second. The planned launcher would toss a two-ton rocket projectile out at four to seven kilometers a second, with an orbital payload capacity of somewhere around 330 kilograms. Uh, if you want more details, read the references at the end. Also, unlike conventional gunpowder guns, this would be a two-stage system. The first stage would use natural gas combustion to ram a piston down the barrel, which would then pressurize and heat up hydrogen in the second stage of the gun, which would get it faster. This led to the creatively named Super High Altitude Research Project, SHARP. It, it never got pointed upward, unfortunately. SHARP ended up relegated to firing ramjets at three kilometers a second out of the barrel, among other payloads. Though one notable payload was a mock-up of a ruggedized gun launch satellite, which survived and worked. In 1996, the project was shut down, and John Hunter decided to form his own company called the Jules Verne Launch Company. That sounds kind of familiar. This led to Quick Launch, an updated version of Sharp and the Jules Verne Launcher. The first planned gun would have been built on Adak Island off Alaska. Eventually, a larger gun was planned to be built on an oil rig. Now, this has an obvious vantage over Harp and Babylon in that you could move it and aim it depending on customer launch needs. They also planned on capturing the hydrogen from each firing to use it again. Quick Launch planned on being a propellant depot resupply vehicle, launching up to half a ton of propellant on each firing. But the company didn't make enough money and they're gone. This doesn't mean space guns are dead. John Hunter is still at it with Green Launch. But this isn't Know Your Space Gun. We're here to see if you can shoot one to the moon. Before we get going, I want to make a, a quick note. Space guns work. All of this works. There's no catch to this. You can fire payloads into space with a cannon. You can make electronics that can survive these launches, even scientific instrumentation. Propulsion systems can survive a launch. Now, for solid motors, you'll need something to fill up the combustion chamber before it fires to prevent the grain from collapsing. But Bulls solved that. The TRL for space guns is 6 to 7. All these parts work independently, they've just never been integrated. Now again, you're not going to launch anything delicate or living, but there is a potential market for raw materials and ruggedized satellites. Plus, the big benefit here is you can fire this gun several times a day in a wider variety of conditions than a normal rocket could use. The only downside is you, you pretty much can't build anything bigger than what we've seen here based on my research. On to what we're doing, which is launching a useful payload on a lunar flyby. Now, what I would consider to be a useful payload launched by a space gun is a four kilogram spacecraft. For reference, your average CubeSat weighs about 1.3 kilograms, so I figure a sufficiently ruggedized system is about four. And I'm not an electrical engineer, so we're just gonna do the mass estimates. And no, I'm not gonna cheat and go from LEO to the moon using ion thrusters. Yeah, you could do that, but it would take over two years to do it, and you'd spend a lot of time in the Van Allen belt. I'm not actually designing a gun either, just the, the rocket bit. Sorry. Instead, I'm gonna take stage data from these launchers and then plug that into Excel, specifically uh, looking for the delta V of the vehicle. And then to get lunar payloads, I'll just add 3.2 kilometers a second to the delta V. If that doesn't work, then I'll design a, an actual rocket that'd go in there. First up is using HARP. Now, Bull designed two Martlet 4s that could carry payloads into LEO from Barbados. The first would be an all-solid system, and the second would use two liquid upper stages. The all-solid Martlet 4s payload can be seen in this chart. Now, I didn't get any data on the upper stage's uh, ISP, so I assumed it to be 290 seconds. This is reasonable. 
Now, if I plug this into Excel, the baseline all solid Martlet 4 cannot launch anything to the moon. Now, this is the liquid Martlet 4. The first stage is still the solid one, and then it's got two liquid upper stages. Now, the ISPs for these are listed as 350 seconds, but this uses a storable fuel, so I lowered it to 320, which is more realistic. Now, if I plug the data into Excel, I end up with 11.7 pounds to the moon, or 5.3 kilograms. This works, theoretically. Okay, on to Babylon, which could theoretically shoot 200 kilograms to Leo with a 2,000 kilogram rocket. I tried applying Martlet data to this and I could not make it work. I honestly could not make any aspect of this work. I couldn't find anything. Okay, so I went searching for details on what Babylon's payloads would look like and all I could find was one diagram showing a single solid stage system in a CIA report. Declassified, of course. I'm going to assume that if the Babylon payload was like Martlet, then it could have theoretically tossed some payloads to the moon using liquid stages. Sharp, Jules Verne, and Quick Launch presented a lot more I could work with than Babylon, but there are still issues I'll have to work with with those. Quick Launch's payload was meant to be propellant, so the vehicle itself would be just big tanks instead of a separate payload bay. So for this, I'll be looking at Jules Verne's early uh, launcher designs and extrapolate from there. There were three proposed rockets to be launched from the Jules Verne gun at three different velocities, 7.1 kilometers a second, 5.3 kilometers a second, and 4.71 kilometers a second, with increasingly heavy payloads, respectively. You can see it in this chart. This was a solid system, and the engine ISP was about 290 seconds. These vehicles alone couldn't send a payload to the moon, and neither could an optimized single-stage system based on stage data. When I made a two-stage system based on stage data, like the structural ratio, engine ISP, and a rough mass estimate, then I could get payloads to the moon. I end up with 19.3, 61.9, and 104.5 kilograms to the moon on these three vehicles, which is a very useful payload. And for reference, the capstone mission, which is being launched on an Electron next year, weighs 26 kilograms. If I were to switch over to liquid propellants for the upper stages, then I could have probably increased my payload capacity to even more than that. Was Jules Verne right? Conceptually. Columbiad, as is described in the book, obviously would not have worked, but Verne and others at the time just didn't know that. But, based on HARP and other space gun proposals and tests, yes, you could shoot something to the moon with a gun. But still, again, not, not people, of course. Except maybe they're... they're ashes. Hmm. Space guns are possible with the right people, resources, money, well, and locations. They present a dumb, cheap, and reliable architecture for low-cost space access. I'm the pressure-fed astronaut. Not played by Frank Langella. Oh look! Jerry Bull! Who's this? Bye.